So here we are with Sam Rye Creasy. How are we doing, my man? Very well, thank you. How are you doing yourself? I always find it funny when you have your fights. You announce it like Sam Urai, like it's a different nickname. <laughs> Near the commentary back. How, um... Some people still don't understand it now. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. So, talk me through um, quarantine and lockdown. How's it treating you at the minute? What's going down? Uh, it's not that different from normal, particularly apart from uh, no grappling, no wrestling, no sparring. I'm still doing my striking on the bags most days. Doing the shopping for uh, for the family, uh, my, my wife's family. So uh, yeah, that's it pretty much. How's it? So, regards to your sort of solo training, like your bag work and stuff, like you've always been quite prominent on like social media doing your sort of solo stuff. Where have you kind of got that from? That kind of structure and I don't know things you're working on. Um, I guess I've always kind of liked training by myself anyway. I kind of look back at some of the old boxing uh, films and that and see them out by themselves in the woods and then doing their own kind of thing and um, you know that kind of uh, that kind of appealed to me so I've got a bag in the garden always been able to run by myself uh, do my own bag work and that and uh, kind of get it done I don't have to rely on anybody else well, this is it as well. Something that sort of stood out as always your discipline with everything else. Like everyone's always said that about your work rate and everything else has always been quite remarkable. Regards of your like martial arts journey, how did it all start? Um, so I was I was late to martial arts. I finished playing uh, rugby. I think twenty twenty one. I realised I'm I'm not getting any taller. <laughs> And uh, <laughs> uh, I was invited to go to local kind of, kind of a boxing sort of class, um, which was good. And it was fun. Um, but then um, a little later on, another gym opened up in uh, Leighton Buzzard, uh, where me and my brother lived. Um, and we were invited down by the owner. He said to come along and train, and kind of we'd just gone from there. So, was that MMA specifically, or was that a particular discipline? Uh, yeah, it was MMA. MMA, in the very basic terms, we had no idea what we were doing. There was a basement full of like-minded people who, you know, had watched some UFCs and were interested in seeing kind of what works and just like to fight really. <laughs> uh, I think we were kind of lucky that when we started there were like-minded people around and they wanted to train, train hard and we kind of did it very much the wrong way <laughs> in, uh, in the techniques and kind of the way we structured our training perhaps but no, it was a it was a learning experience and it was a good experience. So you touched on a few things there, you sort of go into that then. Talk me through the wrong ways of doing things. What was the setup like? How was it all different? Uh, you know well, I don't when I say it was the lo- wrong way, it was more about just learning. Learning the wrong way. Because there was nobody who was kind of like a coach as such. We didn't really know what what the MMA world was like. I mean, I used to be on the Cage Warriors forums many years ago, looking for fights, <laughs> trying to uh, trying to work out what I'm supposed to be doing with, uh, with weight cuts and you know how to structure training. Uh, but basically, we'd spar seven days of the week, do some fitness stuff, and then uh, go home, and, go home and eat. <laughs> Well, this is where it gets quite interesting, is the, I don't know, the layman's idea of what a, an MMA fighter's training routine is, which is just fighting all the time and, you know, not eating a lot, which 
they're not far off but it's more just <laughs> getting it a bit more specific and everything else so talk us through a normal training week for you when you're not in quarantine like say you've got a fight coming up what's your usual fight camp structure looking like uh it doesn't really change too much from a fight camp to regular training for me really because if, if i'm not in a fight camp then i'll probably be helping somebody else out in their own fight camp so i can't neglect my sparring or or, or training at some of the other gyms that i like to go with so i would probably take a trip up to birmingham once or twice a week do some rounds up there I'll take a trip over to BST, Northampton, do some rounds over there with you guys. Um, two, three times of the week, I'll be uh, on the bag or maybe on the pads. Um, and then the other days I'll be doing Jiu-Jitsu over at RBA with uh, Ken. So there's a few things I sort of wanted to get into with this, because obviously starting in Leighton Buzzard, how did you start going to these other places then? What was the initial... I don't know, reason for finding these people? Um, so, well, I'll give you an example. My first fight, uh, I took after six months. I, I, went, I went there, I've been doing pretty much kickboxing, or a form of kickboxing. Uh, didn't really have a ground game at all. Uh, had no idea what a takedown was. Um, when we got there, it was a no head strikes, uh, no headshots fight. Um, and about halfway through my walkout, I realized, oh my God, what am I going to do here? <laughs> that, I lost that fight. Um, I got submitted in the first round. Uh, and then after that, I went training like crazy, just grappling every, everybody who came in the gym and sparring and you know do, doing everything I could to get as, as good as I could possibly get in that short time frame. Um, took another fight, learned some more grappling, won that fight. Um, and I've kind of progressed from there slowly. Uh, been in and out of gyms pretty much all over the country. I mean, I really got no no time for, for gym politics and all of that shit. It comes up, I'm happy to train with everybody and anybody. My career is short, so if, if I'm going to fight you, maybe we're going to fight down the line, but I would like to train with you as well. I'll tell you what I find really interesting about yours and Tom's sort of training style is that you spar with everyone. And mm -hmm. when it comes to a lot of smaller guys, they tend to neglect people i don't know bigger than sort of lightweights wellweights how come mm -hmm. you guys have been able to develop that kind of style like what would you say has helped you be able to train smartly with other people of all sort of weights <laughs> uh, stupidity initially i think i I've, <laughs> I've probably got my head caved in many times when I was initially starting out by people a lot bigger than me um, and you know maybe there's that little bit of fight in me which just wants to wants to give it back until they give up pretty much um, now I'm, I'll try to steer away from that I'm a bit clever in how I how I move when we're sparring I make sure I'm not really going with somebody who's going to lose control you know and uh my brother's even better with that really he knows he do his five rounds and then get out whereas me i kind of want to do five rounds and then i've warmed up and i want to do another one for that and then i want another five for a cool down <laughs> well, this is every sparring session for anyone who hasn't trained with sam we do our five six rounds whatever it is and turn around, you'll see Sam in the cage saying, oh, I just wanted to do more rounds, oh, I'm just getting started, you know, kicking. <laughs> and I don't know why, I think it's so, like, fluid almost, because the way you're, when we spar and stuff, you're not necessarily trying to take my head off. I think you're just being nice, but I think it's that kind of smart sparring as such. I think, do you, how, when you have your sparring sessions, 
do you have specific goals in mind? Are you trying to achieve certain things? Is it regards of intensity? Is it a workout? How do you see your sparrings? Uh, yeah, I've got, I've, I do try and have a goal for each round, depending on the opponent and depending on if I've got a fight coming up and that, that sort of thing as well. Uh, the majority of the time, I'm just trying to be sharp. The, sh the sharper I am, the, the cleaner I can be in a fight. I know when I can pull a punch, you know, and if, if I want to go and hit something hard, I'll go and hit the bag. I don't need to take it out of somebody, you know, especially as these people are going to be my training partners. I need them. <laughs> if, I, <laughs> if I give somebody a kick in one week, guess what's going to happen the next week? I'm going to spar, I'm going to leave them for a fight camp, and uh, they've, uh, they've decided not to turn up today. You know, and then that's my fault. So that was probably a little bit of the old me. And that, that was the way we trained back then. We just kind of beat the living shit out of each other and then went, went home, did the same thing the next day. But, you know, now it's, it's a lot more like, okay, can I not get caught with, you know, had his jab today? <laughs> can I try and run away from Raymond long enough that he can take me down? <laughs> Yeah, that is me every single day when I spoil with those boys. <laughs> I just run away. <laughs> it's a big enough gym, you can keep running, it's all right. It's only five minutes you've got to stay away from them for. That's it, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I think it's quite interesting is that transition between the old school versus the modern day and how it keeps evolving. Mm. And reg are there things that you guys used to do feel you're missing in modern day training, like structure wise or intensity or anything like that? It's hard to tell, to be honest. <laughs> really, I'll tell everybody all the things that I did starting out were wrong, and they're all the things that make me a good coach now because I've experienced all the bad situations. I've done all of those things. I've done the bad weight cuts. I've done the turning up for a fight by yourself, doing a, doing a night shift at work, Cutting weight all night, driving up to St. Helens the next day, four hours drive, getting on a treadmill, cutting weight again. You know, but there are a lot of stupid things back then. But nowadays everything's a little bit a little bit smarter, a little bit more a little bit more technical with the training. I do find a lot a lot of the guys that tell me, Oh I don't I don't feel like I'm doing enough, I'm doing enough. Who are kind of like the old school like me, um, and I feel that myself sometimes. Like I said, with inspiring rounds, it's very difficult for me to say, "Okay, five done, go home." Five is like my performance rounds, and then I want another five rounds to have some fun. You know, it's it's. It's a difficult balance. And this is the same with the sparring as well, probably. I mean, I sparred with my brother for how many years now. He's the only person that I'm going to fucking hit that hard. And he'll do the same to me. But then we've got to know when to, when to pull it back. <laughs> There's a few things I sort of wanted to get into there. So we'll work backwards. So you and your brother train together and competing alongside one another. What is that? What has that been like? So talk us through. What, who fought first out of you two? Was it you or him? Well, my brother started martial arts uh, quite a few years before me. Um, he was having some some kickboxing fights and that. So I, I went and watched him fight kickboxing quite a few t quite a few times, I think. Um, but that, that scene was a little bit harder to get into and the style that they were fighting was like light contact and stuff and he got disqualified for hitting too hard, <laughs> which is not surprising. Uh, Old habits and all that. I can't remember if he fought first or I fought first, MMA. Yeah, I know his first fight was up in Sunderland. Um, and I think my first fight was in Norwich. 
I, I, I can't remember, to be honest. It was a long time ago. <laughs> but that's an interesting thing itself, the fact that there weren't that many local shows. You had to go around the country and everything else. But, but the point I'm sort of getting at with this is, what was it like cornering your brother and seeing him in that, obviously in the moment? Because obviously training is one thing, but being in that high-pressure environment where it's, you know, you know it's like seeing a teammate or, you know, his brother, in fact, fight. It's a very different atmosphere. What was that like? Uh, you know, it, it's easy for me to fight. The, the only pressure I get then is probably letting down people. When I watch my brother fight, or any of my guys really, but more so my brother, it, it's it's that protective nature that I, I want to go in there, I want to fuck the guy up first, but daring to step in the cage with him, and thinking that he could hurt him, and then my brother's going to fuck him up anyway. Like it's, it's, I'm very emotional. <laughs> when I'm cornering him, which is sometimes why I like to get somebody else to uh, step in for me. Um, but then as soon as I think that, I want him to get out so I can be right there next to the cage. <laughs> well, this is it. It's so like back and forth, all these emotions as well. That's what I was kind of going to get at as to whether or not you feel you're, that you're too close to him to then be in that sort of corner situation. Because again, when you're, you know, as much as he is a training partner, he is always going to be your brother first, and you need to, you know, sort of, I don't know, see what's best for him sometimes. But it depends on how you can really manage these kind of emotions, because it's all over the place, these kind of things. Yeah, yeah, true. Um, I've got a hold of it in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> I think in that, when I'm in the corner... The only advice I'm giving him really is just be who you are. You know, be that person I see in the gym every day. There's technical advice that's going to come from other people as well. But, you know, if he wants me to be there, I'll be there. The moment that he says he, would, he wants somebody else to be in his corner, that's not a problem either. It's, you know, I'm here for him no matter what. I'll be here for him throughout his fight camps. I'll be here for him as long as he needs and I know he's the same for me now regards of him being in your corner how mm. do you find that yeah it's good it's good he, he has a nice balance between the other two guys that I have in my corner normally Richard and Kev are a little bit more uh, laid back and my brother will just give me a slap and tell me to get me head out of my arse pretty much Kev's going to keep the advice technical on the ground. Richard gets a bit excited sometimes, but who can blame him? <laughs> uh, and then my brother's the guy who's going to G me up, tell me exactly what I'm fucking doing wrong. I said with no like, consideration to be nice about it. <laughs> just no. more, matter of fact, honesty. There's it's no time. Want. It's, it, and it's, it's not just in a fight. You know, if you're fucking around in a fight camp, you know, if you're fucking around in the gym, if you, you're having an easy day or whatever, or you're letting somebody do something you shouldn't be, he's going to be the one who's on top of you. <laughs> and I'm the, I'm the same for him as well. Oh, he's going to cause friction sometimes. You've got to be told sometimes as well. Oh, 100%. You need to have that sort of responsibility for each other because, you know, if you let them, you know, make a mistake you're optionally let them make, then it also becomes in your responsibility then. It becomes your... You know, it's part of your fault. Yeah, of course. So talk to me about your fight days then. So what's your sort of fight day routine in the sense of, do you have a similar sort of thing you've sort of done over the years to try and keep yourself in a level head or do you like to get psyched up? What's your preference? <laughs> <laughs> I, I have no idea. It changes from fight to fight. Seriously, like, fucking... <laughs> Every... Like I said, I've had lots of experience. It's <laughs> from the worst weight cuts to the fucking the worst rehydrations, the worst fucking bounce backs, just everything completely wrong. So sometimes they're going right, you know. Um, I've tried getting myself, you know, what's the word like G'd up, I guess, before a fight and that and. That hasn't really worked. <laughs> I 
I find myself sometimes, I'm walking out, and I'm looking in the crowd, and I'll see somebody, I think, fucking hell, that looks really like somebody that I know. And then I'm like, where the fuck is it? Looking in the cage and that, it's the other side, and then fucking the next thing I know, oh shit, we're fighting, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> my, my mind could wander sometimes, but you know, I've, I've tried to stay calm. I used to, I used to sleep a lot before, um, before my fights as an amateur. There was no like, uh, there was no pressure. There. You know, a lot of fun. Um, and now, like, I, I put a lot of pressure on myself. And it's good. I've got a lot of support, but again, that that builds more pressure on yourself as well. Regards of that pressure, then, what do you feel like that pressure is for? Is it for you to fulfil, I don't know, a preset goal or to achieve a standard you're setting yourself? What do you think that stand those this pressures are? To fulfil my potential, really. I know how good I am. I've been around fucking. Too many gyms around the world, and I was part with some of the best guys in the world, and held my own. I've been in places where I'd be like, I'm ready, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm fucking good. But then it's the ability to cross over from that guy who's in the gym and put it into practice in the cage in front of however many thousands of people watching. I think that's where I think that's where the pressure is for me, and and letting those people down. You've seen what I'm capable of. But but this is it. This is sort of where I'm kind of getting at when it comes to fighting on these big shows and like, take your um title fights for example. What? How did you feel for the fight camps for those opposed to a normal fight camp? Did you feel more pressure in the usual build up? Did you feel I don't know. What was that occasion like? The whole build-up and the day itself. My first, the first type of fight I had, the the build-up was not good. <laughs> the build-up was wrong. I tried to change a lot of things around that. First time doing five, five fives, I stopped doing most of my weight training and that, and I, I got too skinny, basically. <laughs> Way too skinny for the weight, and then I wasn't strong. Um, I, I made a lot of mistakes like, throughout that camp, thinking oh, I've got to do this, I've got to do it like that, I've got to do this. And then what happened was, I just wasn't me in the cage. I didn't get to express myself. I was fighting defensively looking for his mistakes to capitalize on. Um, the second part, I can't really say much to him today. It was a good camp, you know. I was a little bit more experienced for it. And I was, uh, I was far more comfortable with uh, taking the five fives. How did you feel after the first one? Because obviously this is a huge opportunity and then you don't get the result in the end. What was your mindset after that point? Was it, you know, call it a day, this isn't for me? Was it, you know, that wasn't me in there? What was your initial, I don't know, reaction and then response to it all? Um, I was disappointed. Very disappointed, obviously. Um, I felt I was the better fighter and I felt I was winning the fight. But you can't take your eye off the prize. And, you know, it was demoralizing for that day, for the rest of that night. But once that was done, there's, there's, no, there's, no, there's no quit in me. I'm going to keep on going, and I'm going to keep on going until I get that title and until I achieve the goals that I've set out for myself. Um, it doesn't doesn't really matter what happens. Each, each time I get into the cage, I do feel I improve in some areas, and I, I find some other areas that I can can be improved on. I was gonna say that is a um, really sort of interesting take on it all because obviously you've, like you said, you lost your first fight ever, and all this kind of stuff you've had losses before, 
And even on that kind of scale, you sort of have the same mindset of, okay, back to the drawing board, I've still got the same goal. And again, even your first, you said it earlier, your first fight, you okay, the problem was grappling, work on grappling. You had that initial, okay, trial and error mindset with it. It was really interesting to see you still held that kind of, I don't know, problem solving thing that got you there in the first place, got you to that, that, that spot. Regards of your, this is what I want to ask then, your weight cuts then. Talk me through the bad weight cuts. What did you used to do? What was the usual like start versus end weight in the process opposed to now? Yeah, the actual, the weight difference was never really an issue. It was the fucking, <laughs> it was the fact that I didn't have somebody around me to tell me this is what you're supposed to do. So I, want, I would look online and assume that, okay, right, this guy says, Fighters are cutting 20 pounds. Fucking hell, that's a lot of weight. All right. <clears throat> I've got to cut 20 pounds. All right. I'll do that once. I'll be fucked for a fight. <laughs> and then I'll learn something. This is, more, this is more towards my pro career anyway. But when I was an amateur, I would do a day of weighing. I would go to a shitty fucking pub and eat two mixed grills and then fight a couple of hours later. And... That's your hydration that, that would, that would be, <laughs> I would, don't think I would drink much water, just have a couple of monsters, <laughs> and I'd be ready to go. But then, What's the know, problem exactly? I'm trying to find it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, as I've turned pro, like, I made some, some bad mistakes. We did a one-weight cut. I think I cut maybe maybe four kilos, and then stopped and said, okay, now all right, we've cut the four kilos. That means we've only got 0.5 or whatever to go. Let's get in the car. We've got to drive five hours to Newcastle. <laughs> okay? So I'm in the back seat of a fucking tiny little car. <laughs> we get up there. They look in the back. My fucking face is my lips are blue. Oh, shit, he's going to die. They get me in there, put me on the scales on that. Oh, shit, it's the same weight. Okay, sweet, we've got to find a sauna. Take me to a sauna. It's fucking tiny, like the size of the fucking car. Three enormous blokes in there. And I've got a shadow box. <laughs> and a set of stairs that's <laughs> With my coats, the credit card, scraping sweat off my back. With them trying to ask me questions. What are you doing, man? What are you doing? What are you running on the spot, lad? <laughs> well, sorry, we changed places. Is that not Newcastle anymore? Where, where is this? <laughs> what was that accent? Oh, wow. It's the sight of that. It's the small, like, I don't know, like a covered size, like, sauna. And then there's you, just like a skeleton, just the brink of death on a shadow box. <laughs> Not a pretty sight. No, not a pretty sight. <laughs> then you know, like they're learning things, just the same way as like I used to. I would have a pizza after weigh-ins and that, maybe a kebab, maybe something else. I give up on the, on the nutrition side. I'm just gonna get fat as fuck and then fight tomorrow. And then you know. Now I've changed slightly. I'm a little bit better with that, but. Would you have instead like cakes or something? Yeah. <laughs> you don't want to see how much it gets you after a weigh. It's terrifying. <laughs> well, your weight cuts are always quite interesting on Instagram because you always see you posting lots of food stuff. Yeah. <laughs> That's self torture. <laughs> it's got better over the years. I mean, I'm not eating crap anymore. I, I think I even I bought a nicer. Uh, that's Japanese, Japanese dish for me and my coaches last time. <laughs> little wagamamas, was it? No, no, no. A little classier than that, isn't it? Oh, yeah, sushi, <laughs> was it? <laughs> no, no, I, I don't even know what it was called. It was good, though. <laughs> so what's the plan for you after lockdown, then? Have you got anything lined up you can tell us about? No, nothing. Realistically, like... Since my last fight, I wanted, I was, I had no injuries, <laughs> apart from to my ego. The biggest I was ready injury. To go for fucking you can't really rehab July. that. Well, June it was even. 
the end of June last year, I was ready to go. Ready to go, ready to go, ready to go, waiting on another chance, maybe here, no, okay, oh fuck. Okay, well that's the year out. Okay, we'll start 2021, uh, sorry, 2020, <laughs> in fucking, in, in start, we'll get another, another fight. And then, you know, it's kind of just prolonged after that. Struggling to get matched, I guess, now. And hopefully, once this all ends, I can, I can get a fight and just get back out there, get my name back in the hat. Regards of um, your fight camps whilst coaching, how do you find that balance? Um, difficult. <laughs> difficult. Especially, uh, now started coaching, it's difficult for me to be as, as selfish. And I find myself, even when I try to be more selfish, being brought back in to, uh, I, I need to help this guy out more with this, I need to do this, I need to do that. And then I start to neglect my own training slightly. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a tough one with coaching. I think maybe I could have more time to focus on myself if I wasn't coaching as much, but then I do enjoy putting time into those that I've trained so far and seeing them go out and compete. I mean, it, a lot of it seems to be like where, I don't know, uh, what's the priority really? Because obviously mm. you want to try and please everyone and try and do everything, but something's got to give. And it's yeah, a tricky one really, isn't it? It is, and like the coaching, it, it gives me the freedom to train like pretty well most of the time. But would it be easier for me to just have a job a couple of days a week and then focus on myself completely and selfishly for the other five days of the week and get my fights that way? Who knows? If you didn't go down the route of MMA, where do you reckon you'd be today? What would you be doing? Maybe in the army. I think maybe in the army. Who knows? Who knows? Probably a bit in jail or dead. <laughs> it's quite interesting yeah. you said the army though, because that's a very team orientated thing, whereas MMA, as much as it's classed as a individual sport, is also very team based as well. I'd have thought, I don't know, because you also used to play rugby as well, so it's a bit of a... I like the discipline of martial arts, and I think that goes hand in hand with the army. Although it is a team thing, I think it's a rugby as well, but I think it's, it's more the discipline. I could live my life <laughs> that way. You can justify that's, the that's cauliflower is as well. <laughs> <laughs> that's the point. Where did the cauliflowers come from? Was it the um, rugby or the MMA? Uh, MMA, MMA. Uh, I got them, I can't remember how many years ago, um, but it was enormous, purple, fucking throbbing bastard, and I think when I eventually got it drained, uh, Danny, uh, Danny Batten, your coach, he was over for a session for some sparring, uh, had my head all wrapped up, pulled the fucking wrap in the bandage over my eyes and beat the fucking shit out of me. <laughs> I don't doubt any of that. <laughs> He's a special one. He's very unique. There's certainly only one. Now, Sam, most important question, where can people find you? Uh, all my social medias. <laughs> it's Samurai Creasy. Everywhere. Well, Sam, you're right, Chris, either. Or... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for listening, guys. And this episode has been sponsored by Mola MMA. Use code FCMMA20 at checkout on MolaMMA.com for 20% off on all products.